source. I use it in my day-to-day -day work where I get all the Azure updates and stuff. So it's really useful. So join it if you like. And with that, we want to get started. I just want to say a couple of words about Jesper. <laughs> He's uh, actually the first IT consultant I interacted with. 98? 98, so yes. 98, something like that. And uh, the, the company I worked for, we needed some help, of course. So Jesper came knocking. And uh, I mostly opened the doors and gave him coffee and such. And he installed <laughs> Windows Server 2000, I think it was. We had an NT4 at that time. And uh, yeah, it was really cool. But oh, Jesper always talked fondly about IT industry. So eventually, I figured, yeah, I'll try it out. He warned me, though. He said, you will have homework forever. And he wasn't lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's fun. But on the security part, we actually got hit by uh, a famous virus back in the days called NIMDA. And uh, we called, <laughs> called for some help, and Jesper came and uh, fixed all of the stuff. But he got me running around the, the, <laughs> the building, installing all the computers with a disk. Uh, I think it was 20 of them, so I had to reinstall them, download all the stuff, reboot, and so, and so on. And uh, yeah, it was a good learning. But that was kind of my first interaction with any security breach or security stuff. And uh, eventually he told me that Nimda is admin backwards. So if you didn't know that, now you know it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, with that, I want to hand over to you, Jesper. Lovely, thank you. And I have to say, the first, that, that was my first training in making people run and I having coffee. <laughs> and that's what I normally do. Um, I drink coffee, that's I would say. My main profession is, because is a security architect and professional coffee drinker. Let's see if we can get the picture running here. So, got it on my end. Now we've got it. I really love Hello for Business, when it works. There we go. Perfect. How to implement zero trust. So, my name is Jesper Kroukheide. And if you never ever heard the name Kroukheide before, you could just imagine how it is to work in an international setting. They normally call me crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> so it, yeah, it, it, it is a bit challenging, but it, it works out. So Zero Trust is something brand new. It's only been around for like 18 years or something. I started working with Zero Trust, I think it was 2005, 2006. No, what was it called? Uh, Jericho or Jericho 2.0, part of the open group Jericho Forum. And it's kind of interesting to see how it evolved. Like, I remember when I had my first training sessions about Jericho, that we call it then, and trying to explain what you needed to do. And people just looked at me, can't we just use a firewall? And I still hear that. I was actually at a customer two years ago and told them, you actually would need firewalls first. Those customers actually exist. Um, Hmm, interesting. I had the wrong presentation in my computer. Let's see. <laughs> so I have one presentation in at my laptop and one on the screen, and that didn't work out. There we go. Help me. Resume slideshow. <laughs> I love technology. I really love technology. So let's stop. Perfect and full screen. Now it works, perfect. So why do we talk about zero trust? What has happened? So my main profession at Microsoft is I'm working what's called CRISP, C-R-S-P. And if you call me, 
that's bad news because that means you've been hacked. And that means that you need some help and a normally quite devastating attack. So if you call me, if you if Lisa want, not only want help, but actually want to have, what should we do before? That's a good thing. Then I would love to come. I don't love to, to come out when you have been hacked because it's quite disastrous and everything. Why are people getting hacked? Why are the companies getting hacked? Well, we know IT is complex. When we started out, we started running out around with disks, fixing things, you know, you reinstall the computer. I, I actually started working with IT with punch card computers. So that's how old I am. IT today is complex, as you see with this damn PowerPoint presentation. We have many devices, and we also see with um, with the COVID situation that suddenly the network that we used to work in, the secure network, actually had <laughs> stretched our, into our homes or into our cars or cafes or wherever we were working. So, yeah, it's kind of complex. We tried the networking thing, trying to have the secure network, firewalls and everything, and it, it did work quite well for a while. Then the only chance we have, we have a disk sometimes and mails, we still have a problem with mails. But we also learned that when you breach the network you're in, and that happens quite frequently. I, if you're watching Swedish television, SVT, there's a series, a mini series called Hackad, Hacked. I really uh, urge you to see it, it's quite interesting. What I, see that, what I see in that, from my perspective, is that all those that are breached, they don't deploy zero trust. That's old style security. Hackers got in, they managed to sniff the network, find the Active Directory server and the home free. Or they took the home network. If you've seen the series, why on earth would someone have a router outside standing and just uh, exposed in their network? Well, we know trusted network doesn't work. It still has a function, absolutely, but it's not enough. And that's the key thing, it's not enough. We need to do something more. We also have a lot of other interesting st stuff, like bring your own device, um, mobile device, I actually don't know what WFH stands for right now, SaaS services, I might be, could be work from home, that's a good thing. Yep, perfect. Then I learned something new today. Good day today. And also, the hackers are quite advanced. They move forward. So, so they realized, okay, that firewall is quite hard to breach. But if you send someone a mail and ask them to click a link, they will click the link. And people are doing that. I, I, I did a test once where I took a file with the malware and I encrypted it within zip. I sent the file to people with the password telling them, do not open this file. That is an, an, um, a Word document with the malware in it. Don't do it. 70% downloaded the file, decrypted it, and clicked the link. I just, so that's why, where we are. That's why we need training for people not to trust all of this. F but people do it. And what we are seeing is that identity theft. Because what, what are we interested in as a hacker? We want to have that person's identity. Because then we can start doing things in that person's name. So, very nice with the firewall. But if I have the right to get access to that server, no, ma no matter what firewall will uh, pass that. So, and, but we actually have had an evolution of the firewall during the years. So, the, the firewall actually starts with the physical firewall the building. So if we were inside the data center, we couldn't get access to the information. Then we started with this network thingy. So, and that's where we still are today. Secured network. So we had a logical firewall. I'm still talking about firewalls today, but now I'll talk about identity firewalls. So the things that protect the information we have that I authenticate through my identity. And that type of firewall is, of course, encryption. And if I have my data encrypted, it's no matter where it lies, it will still be protected, as long as I can authenticate to it and no one else can authenticate to it. So, and that's one thing that we also achieve with Zero Trust, to actually enable us to work from wherever we, where we ever want to work, not only from the office, not only from home, but when I'm on an airplane, when I'm waiting in the lounge, when I'm at the cafe, I can work wherever I want. I do seven, sorry, I do 30% of my work nowadays from my mobile phone. 
that's kind of interesting we're looking at what I normally do. But all my mailing, I prefer actually to do it on my phone rather than sitting on my laptop. Reading documents, I can gladly do it uh, on my phone. Not when I'm driving though, but still. And we, we also enable all of this I IoT stuff with self-driving cars and all of that. By the way, self-driving cars and algorithms and everything, do you realize that when we are moving more to self-driving cars, we will have a challenge with the roads because all cars try to go in the same lane, same where. And if you ever, if you ever tried self-driving cars, you will see that it always is in the worst part of the road because everyone is driving there. But that, that is kind of interesting. It has nothing to do with zero trust. But the key thing with Zero Trust is the policy engine or policy engines. And to be able to have a policy engine, it needs to be accessible. It needs to be accessible wherever I am. And that means it has to be published on a big network. And so far, the biggest network we have is called the Internet. So probably that's where we need to publish it. Another key thing when we talk about zero trust is what we call raising the attacker's cost. And now we're moving a bit into security architecture and reasoning of security. So we mainly have two big types of actor when it comes to uh, security or actually the threat actors. So we have the more famous one, nation states. Uh, Nobelium is one of them who lay behind the uh, kind of more interesting attacks they can read about. And we also have all the threat actors that make money on this. And there's a lot of money in IT security or further in the attackers part. Uh, we actually surpassed uh, narcotics in a turnover. I think it was 19, uh, 2019 or something. So that's a huge amount of money. Uh, we saw in the news uh, just a few days ago that the uh, media market in uh, Germany was hit by big ransomware. So that's what I normally say. That's my normal life. Uh, not with the media mark though, but other customers. It pops up like in, in my mailbox, like fem ten companies, or five ten ten companies each day. And that's just the biggest one that can afford to have Microsoft working there. But so so we know there's a lot of money. We also know that to be able to protect it, you need to follow best practice. You need to know what is actually working when it comes to security. There are a number of what you call uh, known attack playbooks. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK, uh, spelled M-I-T-R-E, ATT&CK. Uh, it's a very good framework to start looking at playbooks. There are a number of others. Uh, you might heard of the Secure Privacy Access from Microsoft, the Kill Chain and everything. Those are known playbooks that we know this is how an attack works and this is how we block it. And this default behavior, that in many of the ISO standards and many other standards are sort of known attack playbooks that we have solutions to protect. Interesting thing here is that if you don't do all of this, if you don't follow best practice, you don't manage the standard attacks, then there's no way in hell that you actually could protect against everything else because you will have lost here. Very nice to have this shiny firewall and encryption solution, blah, 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 if your users are still clicking on a mail and do not protect against a simple uh, malware from there. So first things first, start with this one. Start with basic hygiene, updates, you know, making sure running Windows updates or Microsoft updates nowadays, update all applications. Second part, and this is a bit more for zero trust, rapid response and recovery. You need to be active, you need to monitor, you need to find the information, know what's happening. At Microsoft, we of course are running our own SOC internally. 100% of our in cases that happens internally are solved within five minutes. That's the baseline, five minutes. How many of you here have, uh, do have a SOC that works with that type of efficiency? Yeah. Uh, Security Operations Center, sorry about that, good, good catch. <laughs> so Security Operations Center actually monitors and see what is happening in the network, where on the malware they connect it, they're using different type of tools like Sentinel to see what is happening. And if something is happening, react, fix it. 
normally, the normal response I see at the customers that are hacked is a response time somewhere between two days and 100 days. 100 days actually happened. We, ha we had one interesting customer where they have a very good SOC. They collected a lot of network information, network logs, IDS information, and they were totally blind because the hack happened on a user that also was an administrator, of course. They jumped into the Active Directory, took full control, turned off all anti-malware. And the anti-malware log weren't sent to the SOC in the first place, so they were totally blind. And this happens all the time, all the time. So when you do breaking the known attack playbooks, you do the monitoring, you make sure that you actually can act, then we can talk on the more interesting security stuff that you probably would need to do. But make sure you spend the money right. So, let's dive into a bit more into Zero Trust and the principles of Zero Trust. So, the name is quite interesting, Zero Trust, I don't trust anyone. And that is correct, I don't trust anyone. How do you sell that to a CISO? Asking. That's a bit, so we have this, oh, we need to trust our users. Yes, and we implement Zero Trust. Bad wording, but that's how it is. We use least previous access. So I shouldn't have more access than I actually need. So when I come out on an assignment, the customer asks me, what type of account do you need? I need the account so I can get access to the coffee machine, but that's more. That's it, that, that, nothing more. That's where I start. And then we see if I need more. And we assume breach. We actually assume that the laptops can be hacked or are hacked. So we verify everything. So we verify user identity. Of course, the logged in. We, we verify the location where I am. We do different type of checks. We say, okay, suddenly Jesper is not logging on from home. He's logging in from um, Malmö, for cafe. Okay. Might that be good? Yeah, well, he's using MFA, so yeah, we can probably allow it in this and see what he does. And then I'm, what I do, what type of applications I open, I say, okay, he's still open PowerPoint. He's still crashing PowerPoint. Okay, that's Jesper, so go with that. So that is the part of verify. Verify everything. Verify the computer and give access based on the risk we take. Zero trust is risk-based. It's not on and off. It's that Either I'm secure or I'm not secure. It's risk-based. We make a risk valu evaluation and see, okay, bad place, good computer, good identity, good MFA. Okay, we can get access to that. And suddenly I try to do the same thing for my mobile. That's actually my private mobile. So, oh, no, you shouldn't get access to that information. Or might they be allowed to read it, not edit it. So it's risk-based. Remember risk-based. That's important. I talked about least previous access. There are a number of those types. So one thing is not having a domain admin account if I don't need it, or global admin is called nowadays in Azure. We make sure that we check that, okay, what time is it? Should, I, should my account actually be active? I will kind of activate my account for one hour. It's not the best protection. If, if I'm a worker as, as an administrator, I would still have the same I would still have to do my work eight hours a day or something. So then just in time wouldn't be it. But if I'm using my account to access a database that I'm normally just doing some minor admin tasks on, yeah, might be good enough. I'll we'll talk a bit more about how you can reason surrounding that. And as I mentioned, assume breach. And that means monitoring. Make sure that you get the logs, that you see what's happening, that you automate, automate all the actions. That is important as well, because there are so many things happening that you can't keep up as a person. The time when we actually saw was reading logs on our computers, ah, it doesn't happen anymore. We automate stuff. Get the logs automated. There are a few things that this leads to. First of all, we get increased security, and that's good because we are not only relying on firewalls anymore, we're protecting the identity, but also increased productivity. Security doesn't become a blocker anymore. Uh, there is a really good uh, British series called The Computer Says No. If you haven't checked it out, do check it out, it's quite fun. But the sec security department was previously known as the department of no. We want to do this. No. We, we want to ac access this SaaS service. I have a customer right now that has procured quite a large uh, SaaS service um, 
within a specific industry. And now the security department says, oh, this public IP with this public API, no, it has to be surrounded by VPN. Uh, but our users need to have access to wherever they are, and the, the our customers need access to it. Yeah, then they need VPN. Doesn't work out. Doesn't work out. And that's, that's the department of no, and that is something we see within different security departments. If they haven't been trained in how zero trust works, and this, I, will, I won't call it modern type of security, it's still 18 years old, uh, but it's still, it's another way of thinking. It's another way of moving the security perimeter. And if they're not trained in that, you get this type of knee-jerk reaction. So VPN is the solution for everything. It used to be a firewall, now it's VPN. You will have micro-segmentation as well as a solution to zero trust. It's one tiny component. We also talk about modern SecOps. So everyone wants to talk about DevOps, SecOps, whatever ops you can put after it. Quite interesting. We used to think that first we develop the application, then we test it, then we give it to administrators and they deploy it and then we have the operations. That doesn't work anymore because things are going faster. That's why we add ops to everything. And then we have OT, operational technology, meaning old style security, old style servers. I actually had my hands on an old Windows NT4 uh, running a power grid uh, a few weeks back. But that's, that's OT. So we're looking at real time technology. It could be within an operating theater uh, where surgeons work with monitoring your heart rate and whatever they do. As I men mentioned, power grids. So things that actually work in real time that has to be certified that always have to work. There were kind of interesting incident. Uh, it went well, gladly. I think it was 2006 where they were suppo supposed to start a surgery, a heart surgery, open heart surgery uh, on a patient. And just before starting, they just checked the equipment and suddenly the machine managing the heart just rebooted. That's not allowed to happen. It's not allowed to happen. And it was rebooted because someone with IT saw, oh, this is affected with the malware and went in, removed it and rebooted. Because someone had connected that to the secure network. That is key thing for me when we talk about zero trust. This is, shouldn't be happen. But we have OT. We still need to manage it. We can't manage that with zero trust. We need to have the combination, have the hybrid of it. But this is something we need to be aware of. When you go out and read about zero trust, you will see a lot of things that says this is zero trust, this is zero trust, this is zero trust. And there's also a lot of things that are implicit for zero trust to get it to work. One part is what's called key management and encryption. Key management is challenging. And key management is so many things. So you have uh, sort of the obvious certificates, network certificates that you need to manage. Uh, you have key management for API. And normally, if you want to register a service for wealth, you will get this key that you need to insert into your application. And actually, how do you manage to copy that insert it into application and do it in a secure way and possibly log it somewhere so you can still get access to it. That is kind of interesting. also part of key management. Uh, and then, so, so there are a lot of things to do. And then it comes to encryption. Just a few days ago, uh, a customer reached out. We want to do like this. Okay, you want to create your own encryption system. Yes, because that's more secure than all the known secure uh, of encryption systems. Yep. Please go ahead. We have this compromise recovery service, uh, so we're glad to come and help you. Uh, after a few minutes of laughing, he realized that that was a faulty thinking. But it still is something you need to manage. And if we're working in bigger organizations, whether then you have to look at how do we manage encryption over the company? How do we make restore? How do you make sure that you actually can restore something on a service that is encrypted? How do you manage your administrators so they don't get access to data beca because that could lead to a GDPR uh, challenge. So th there are so many things to manage within encryption. We also talk about secure development lifecycle. I presume f at least a few of you are working within development. How many of you have read SDL? Hands up. A few. Good. I'm glad. Uh, those who haven't and are working with development, please go read. If you ever want to apply as for a job at Microsoft as a developer, that's mandatory reading. 
and training annually at least, sometimes even more. That also includes threat modeling, risk analysis. Uh, if you haven't done threat modeling, that is something I really strongly urge you to start doing because it's one of the most it was one of the best tools to understand where are my threats within the application dissolution. I, I actually do threat modeling for a component within a car. Actually, car, you know, real car manufacturing. So it's kind of interesting to see how it actually works out. Um, one other thing is continuous security testing. So how did we do it before? Yeah, we did this pen test. So we, dip, we employed some sort of white hat hacker. They did the security test. We got the report like two, three weeks after. Someone read it. There was a list of things we needed to fix. Six months later, we probably deployed that Windows update that has been there for two years. That doesn't work anymore. Security testing should be continuous. Almost every line of code, as soon as you hit enter, it should be tested, making sure that it works. Security testing should be included in the whole devel development process, and you should have what we call blue team, red team, actually something called purple team as well, continuously working, making sure that we get the security tested. Because we are publishing things on internet. That's what we do. We create our websites, we create our applications, our APIs, whatever, and they are on internet. And when I say internet, so we talk about secure network. Did you know that when you have I think it figures around 120 computers on a, on a network. At least one of them will have a malware. And that means someone else is in contro controlling it, meaning that this network isn't secure anymore. So that's the definition of internet, more than 120 computers. Just so you are aware of it. Last thing that I mentioned quite a few times, speed. You have to act within minutes, preferably with automated actions. I have to make sure that you collect the right logs. I had one customer that during the last five years they implemented this amazing IDS solution, so um, intrusion detection system, on all the network gadgets and devices they had all over the internal network. And that's good. After three years, the devices start to go end of life and need to be replaced. But they weren't done with the project. So five years and they still weren't done. We're at 75%. So it started failing from there already. Second part, that they took all those logs they got and dumped it to the SOC. And that was a huge amount of information. And if you ever bought a SOC, you know it's it quite costly, you pay per gigabyte. So they dumped all this log to the SOC and ran out of space, also what they want to pay for. So they didn't get all the other interesting part, like authentication logs from Active Directory, to give you a simple one. So they were breached. Kind of interesting. So getting the right logs, knowing what to actually what actually means something, where you can identify the attacks. This one is a kind of messy. I will not talk through everything about it, but I'll look at the broader things. So when we talk about zero trust, where do we actually focus? So we are looking at the user. And the user in this case would be me. I talked about the risk signals, knowing. So we look at my behavior. What type of applications do I normally do? Um, how do I work? When do I log on? Which IP do I come from? And there are a number of tools for checking that, like Microsoft Defender for Identity. It's, it's the on prem version of uh, identity protection that is in Azure. But just looking at my behavior, so what you call behavior analytics. We look at the authentication part. So, hello for business. Do I use my camera? Do I use my... You know, I actually had to use my password at Lofa Logon to Microsoft recently due to an application that was faulty. And I realized I had forgotten it because I haven't used my password for the last year. We are, we are going passwordless at Microsoft. We actually have a bounty system. Do you have an application that needs VPN or is using password and do not provide integration with Windows um, with Hello for Business? We actually can get a bounty for it. So that, that's kind of cool. But we want to increase trust in the user. And that also means that we are looking for leak credentials. So if you're, you, you might have seen it in, uh, if you're using Edge, you can see that Sometimes you get a list, okay, here's your, your password that has been known to be found in breaches. 
And then you have a long, long, long list of 100 sites where you need to change your password. And I realized I don't use those sites anymore and I don't care. But it's kind of interesting. That is something that is happening, that is integrated. And that is also why we want to come away from passwords. Because the password can be used anywhere you are. I want to be more excited. By anyone, anywhere, without you being there. So that, that's what we're looking at when we look at multi-factors. I, I need to have something more. Like my face, for example. I normally have it with me. It's kind of a good thing. We also look at device. So can we trust the device? Do I have an Azure Join device that has the right security tools, like uh, Defender for Endpoints? Is it what we call Intune Managed? You're all aware what Intune is. So I didn't to what type of threats and risk signals do I get from this one? Have I decided so to install some type of game? Might be okay. Have I installed a crack for it? Uh-uh, bad thing. Reports, and someone calls me. That wasn't a good idea. No, I don't do that. Let me just be clear. So all of that <coughs> makes checks that I'm compliant. So, okay, I fulfill all those access policies, and that's good. And if I'm not fulfilling those, there could be some type of remediation. And then I could get different type of access, depending on how trustworthy my machine is. So I could have lower access if there's a restricted se session because I'm not using my standard device. Could be that, okay, we, we, mon we, we, could we increase the monitoring for this session because I, can I might have requested an admin uh, to ad administer a solution that I norm I, I, it's part of my work, but I normally don't do it. So, and it's a kind of risk logging. So yeah, let's activate more monitoring and see what is happening. And then assume breach. Something is happening, so bang, turn it off directly. And of course, we have all the approved apps that we are using. We can use legacy apps that has been published through App Proxy. This is part of what we call the Microsoft Cybersecurity Reference Architecture. Uh, we will be posting a link about that. Uh, it's actually up there, ak.ms slash mcra. Um, even better. Th that's why I talk about speed. That, that's how it works. You get the information directly. Information at your fingertips, I think Bill, Ga Bill Gates said. So this is actually quite a lengthy presentation, um, but it's really valuable when you're looking at how to use it. This is, of course, with Microsoft products. You might have mentioned that I work there. But you can use it to, monitor, to map other type of applications you have that you see, does it actually fit the bill? Does it work in the context of my security? You might have heard of what we call secure privilege access. Secure privilege access is about how do you secure your administrators. You might have heard of what we call the poor privilege access workstation. So this is one of the core security components that we urge our customers to deploy, especially if they are really already are hacked. So we need to secure, we need to have something we call a trust anchor, and the trust anchor is our dedicated devices. So if I were an administrator at Microsoft, I would have my standard workstation, and then I would have my poor. Then we have all the other use cases. So if we only have this device and then my poor, and I'm doing part administration, where do I draw the line of what is standard administration, what is not standard administration, and what is my standard user behavior? And this is what we call the enterprise access model. So we are looking at what we call privilege access. Privilege access is for, for example, global admins, security admins. So the high privilege accounts that can reach everything. As you're working with Azure, you know perfectly well which account I'm talking about. Intune admin might be there as well. Then we have what we call the management plane. The management plane are administrators, but they access management tools. They could be like the security reader in some cases. It could be uh, resources for uh, administering a number of services, or PaaS service, or other SaaS services for that matter. The, the core thing is we need to make sure that we get hold of it and make have the full management of them, no matter where they are. Then we have the data workload plane. Data workload, so th that's where we look at the information in itself. So I might not be an administrator for the server in itself, but I might uh, administer the database that contains a lot of customer information. 
and that could be sensitive due to legal reg legislations. And then we have the standard user access. So if you heard about the tier model, tier 0, tier 1, tier 2, this is the new model. Previous access, control plane, management plane, user access, data workload plane. What you should start looking at. And this is how we reason about it. And when we look at zero trust from uh, this perspective, we talk about enterprise security, specialized security, and privacy security. Privacy security is, there's our pause, there's our workstations, and dedicated physical workstation with a trusted keyboard. You need to trust the keyboard, you need to trust the rest of it. Where we have our previous accounts, so you have dedicated administration accounts. Always a match in challenge for the SOC to know that admin Jesper Krokeda and Jesper Krokeda is actually the same person. So there needs to be correlation there. Then we have the previous intermed intermediary, where it could be a sort of jump server, could be a bastion host or whatever, and the previous interface. So if I'm doing administration, it sh should be through a dedicated administration interface. And this is more for IT operations. So if you look in the back end of Azure, those that actually manage the real thing, they're using this type of tools. They actually use something called a SOAR, Secure Admin Workstation, that is a dedicated operating system for that specific task. That is the level, so we actually remove all the files, 100% all the files that don't, uh, isn't need needed. So it's kind of interesting. Then we have the enterprise security. So that is my standard device. This one is what we call enterprise security. Well, this is my user device. Am I a local admin on this one? This one? Yes, I am. Most of us at Microsoft are. I would love to say that we don't need to be, but yeah, we work in that type of industry, so we actually need it. Then we have the, what we call the specialized security, and that is the mix and match between those. Actually, a mix and match between enterprise security and specialized security. That's the way you look at how do you actually secure your device in such a manner that is good enough to fulfill the, the risk analysis we've done. So we see that, okay, I'm a database administrator. I don't need this type of security because the risk analysis doesn't point to that. But I probably would need to have uh, application locker. Um, I probably would need to have a dedicated admin account for this device. I probably just using the standard SQL Server admin interface and I don't need a jump server. And that would be fine for that type of work. So this is a part where we're looking at how do we create the application, how do we create our Azure setup to fulfill the needs of administration. So it would be part of DevOps uh, setup. When we talk about administration, there are a few things that we need to take into account, and that's what we call closed loop administration. So I talked about the poor, the trusted system, or the specialized security device. So we need to trust this. And when I mean trust this, this means that everything is updated under my control. So if I'm up updating the BIOS, I download the BIOS twice, different network connections, compare the hashes, and know that, OK, this is actually secured. And then do everything with the same uh, operating system, patches, uh, applications, whatever. I need to trust everything. I have my isolated credential, so I have my admin account. I have my dedicated admi admin account. I won't go as far as stating you need to have one admin account for each task, because then it's not workable. But you should at least have your dedicated admin account and not mix it in the same machine as you're using your standard user account. To make it simple, no mail, no internet on your admin machine. That is the e easy task. And how do you get to Azure portal without internet? It kind of challenging, so that's where we, we, d uh, we deploy a sinkhole uh, proxy or something. Just make sure that you're allowed to go there at least. And then we have uh, conditional access in the other end and just say, okay, this machine, those settings, that name, that user, okay, you're allowed in. And then you have the break glass account because something will go wrong and you couldn't get in otherwise. So please have a break glass account. I might have implemented a specified time. So I'm only allowed to do administration between 8 and 8. That's good. Or I could activate it so someone tells me, you're allowed to do administration now for one hour. If you work in a service desk, you know that you might have this type of 
question so up, you're allowed to administer this machine for one hour. Then it's closed again. Delegation. Delegation is good. You don't need to be a global admin to, for example, set up a new server. You don't need to be a global admin to do whatever you else you would need to do. There are different type of roles, and you should actually work with that. If you're the sole administrator of your company, yeah, of course, you probably do everything with your global admin and not so, but then you need to have your poor for doing everything. If there are many of you, if there are many administrators, then you should look at how do you actually delegate things, making sure you have as few privileges as possible. And then we're talking about the defined network. And I talked about zero trust, the internet is our network, and now it's talking about defined network. There are cases where we actually need to make sure that the network is secured. And that is what we're talking about. When we talk about zero trust, it's a way of thinking, it's a security model, ma mainly based on users, user management, user experience. Then we have all the server admins, we have the server network. We might have everything in Azure, but still there is a secu security part where we have our servers that need to communicate with each other. That's where we talk about secure privacy access and possibly a defined network. Drilling down into Azure, the, the real Azure, the real servers, somewhere way below you will find something called a hardened forest. And you might heard of it, we don't recommend that any anymore. Well, we do in specific use cases, and running Azure is one of them. So that's actually somewhere, and that is very, very secured. So during the pandemic, our administrators were still on site. And they will be on site in Staffan Stop when that's opened up as well. So, I have two more slides. Where are my time wise? Three minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 so. So what we did, we did we do at Microsoft to implement this? So first of all, we verified the identity. And that was a huge task. I would love to say, we only have one AD. Yeah, right. We had a few. We still have a few. But if you're looking at having multiple I, uh, Active Directories or other LDAPs and trying to get all that to work, and then try to sync it to Azure AD, might be challenging. You need to select a central repository that is your identity. You need to move away from all those identity repositories. That is the biggest top. But without a working identity, zero trust will never work. You need to start verifying the device. If you're upgrading to Windows 11, you probably will start looking at doing Intune management, and this one is quite simple to get to work. You start verifying the access. And by verifying the access, it's as simple upgrading network protocols. And we had one compromise recovery recently where we fixed everything, hacker was out, secured the environment, and then custom customer, like two hours later, started applauding and said, why are you applauding now? Oh, you implemented NTLM via version one on all your domain controllers again, the one that actually got you into the trouble in the first place. How, what were you thinking of? And then we started the training. So verifying access means that make sure that you can verify that the one logging in is actually the one logging in, not used in a vulnerability somewhere. It was, by the way, uh, due to that had an old AS400 that wasn't updated, and the same AS400 we have at Michael's uh, company. And then you start verifying the service. You verify everything. You have zero trust. We start verifying. Last slide, I promise. Um, there is a model called RAMP, so Zero Trust Rapid Modernization Plan. If you are looking at how do we, we want to implement Zero Trust, this is what you do. You start validate trust. You start, first of all, go MFA on all user accounts. Start with that. If you're not using MFA today, please do. It's actually free. You can't enforce it, but you can actually activate it. So please go do. And you start ver verify the devices. If you are going to upgrade to Windows 10, 11, preferably 11, start looking at how can we do it with, with Intunes if you're not there already. So if you're still depending on on-prem solutions, not a good thing. It will be challenging moving forward. 
Then you start increase, increasing security. So secure development. Make sure that it's, everything is secure. You write secure code. You don't do those kind of stupid mistakes that we normally do. You wouldn't want me, me to see, see the code I wrote like 2003 or something when I stopped coding. It was all spaghetti. And protect the data. Make sure data is encrypted. If you're using uh, SQL as a pass service, encryption is actually included in the license. So just start encrypting. And there are a number of interesting solutions because I'm, I'm not allowed to say anything what is legal and not legal because I'm not a lawyer. I let the lawyers do that. And we don't do, I don't let the lawyers do the technical part. That's my thing. We have a guy here in the publicum that will be able to answer legal questions. Uh, I won't. But, but that said, there are a number of ways to know that if you are in control of your own encryption key, and, that, and then you store your data in Azure, then obviously Microsoft can't access that type of data. But that might be a solution to get around it. Well, I say might be, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. And then you start modernizing your security operations. You make sure that you actually see what is happening and you see it now. You don't need to integrate and log and move and suddenly it's all down in an on-prem solution with a bad network connection that sometimes work and you don't know what's happening. Or you do an integration and it doesn't work and you blame Microsoft, that has happened. Uh, so yeah, start making sure you get there. So zero trust isn't challenging, but it's the worst thing you will ever do. I have to say it, because if you're all stuck with old solutions and it's challenging to migrate due to old applications and business uses and costs and everything, you're into a world of pain. Because if you're not moving into zero trust and whatever will come afterwards, you're still staying on the old on-prem security, you will be breached. And I know it, five to 10 companies each day. That is in my, mind, my mailbox. That's all for me. Time for pizza break. <laughs> and we could have the discussions in the during the pizza. Or and I'm sorry folks on the on the YouTube. You can still send some uh, questions to Jesper and be, he will be happy to answer them. So uh, yeah. Yeah. No legal questions though. If if you send them, I'll just pass them to Robert. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.